Well, hey, everyone, this past week, we, we got a vivid example of true saving faith. And today, just as in the days of Jesus, there's this there's a big misconception about, about faith and what it truly is. And Jesus uh, chose really a, a providential meeting with a woman from Tyre, the city of Tyre. She was a Syrophoenician woman. Um, and she would have had everything going against her. Um, she would have been a Gentile. She was she was a woman. She Matthew tells us she was a Canaanite. Um, no man would have allowed her uh, in his presence. Uh, but Jesus allows her to come into his presence to teach his disciples and, and us a very valuable lesson about what true saving faith is. You see, she's got a, a daughter who's possessed by a demon, and, and she starts begging him. And Jesus does several things that seem counterintuitive uh, to us. Number one, he's he doesn't answer her a word we learn. He, he almost acts like he's indifferent to her. Um, and then he he tells her over and over, I've only come for the house of Israel. And then he he says something that 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 seems really callous. You know, he, he says, you know, why don't give to the children uh, and then turn around and give it to the dogs? And a lot of people misunderstand this verse and, and think that Jesus is referring to this lady um, as a dog. And it, and it is true that the Jews quite often referred to the Gentiles as dogs, but it's interesting. There's two Greek terms for the word dog. And Jesus purposely uses the one that's not used by the Jewish nation to refer uh, to Gentiles. It's, it's like a pet dog. And the illustration that Jesus is showing this woman is that he has come for the house of Israel, for the Jewish nation. And Jesus has plans for his apostles to set up the apostolic church that will then reach the Gentile nation. And this woman gives an answer that's just completely mind-blowing. She says, yes, Lord. Uh, multiple times, Jesus gives her the answer that she's not looking for. Multiple times, Jesus uh, is going uh, against what this woman thinks is her best, and yet she still agrees and trusts in Jesus. And Matthew ends the account with this lady where Jesus says, O oh woman, how great is your faith. And so it's a vivid example to his disciples at the time because his disciples would have been so confused why Jesus would have allowed this woman to be in his presence to even start with, but then to even listen to her and lend an ear and then uh, to, to, to heal her daughter and say how great your faith is. So it begs the question, what is faith? If someone were to ask you, what is true biblical faith? Faith, because it's so misunderstood. There's so many false teaching about what faith does out there. And what do the scriptures say? Well, Hebrews 11 is, is crystal clear. It says in the first verse, it says, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not yet seen. And so you've got two components to a true biblical faith. Number one, you've got intellectual agreement, where you agree. You know, one common uh, analogy that theologians use is a chair. Um, you know, you, you will intellectually agree that that is a chair, that that chair is designed for someone to sit in. But then there's a second component to faith, and it's trust. To trust in what you agree with and, and to act in that. And the, the trust, in the example of the chair, is to, is to actually sit in it. And so Jesus is, is helping the disciples understand this because then there's another example where Jesus heals a man that's deaf and has a speech impediment. And he commands the man to not say a word. And when we learn the man is, is disobedient and he speaks, that's not really the point of the story here. The point is, why would Jesus command him to be silent? But we get a glimpse of that in the next chapter, in chapter 8, uh, where Jesus asks the disciples, who do people say that I am? And, you know, they give a lot of different things. John the Baptist, Elijah, another prophet. And then he asks a question, he asks all of us, who do you say that I am? And Peter answers him, and he says, you're the Christ. And Jesus strictly charged them to maintain silence about him. And then we get a glimpse, because then he begins to teach them that the Son of Man will be killed and then three days later rise again. And here is the culmination of faith. You see that Hebrews 11, 1, is, it's literally intellectually agreeing with the fact that Jesus is the Messianic King that the Old Testament prophesied about. Jesus is lived a perfect life on this planet. Jesus was completely God. He is the image of the invisible God. And he went to the cross and became sin for us and died for our sins. He took the punishment we deserved and died in our place. And the two aspects of faith are the intellectual agreement, which the demons have that. What the demons don't have is the trust for us to trust in that, to, to go through our very life. And I love when Paul is writing to young Timothy 
in 2 Timothy 3, you know, he tells them, hey, Timothy, listen, everyone who desires to live a godly life will be persecuted. We will face calamities. Um, this false teaching about how faith will, will bring you, automatically bring you physical healing or prosperity is just antithetical to the scriptures. It's not what the scriptures teach. Not that God won't do that. Not that God doesn't answer prayers. But the trust part is not in Jesus's in the power they had, his, the trust is what he did at the cross to reconcile us back to God. And so Paul says, Timothy, man, we're going to be persecuted. And then he says that evil people are going to go on uh, to deceive people and being deceived. And then he says, but for you, you run with endurance. You remain steadfast in what you have been taught. And then he, he talked about that in the scriptures and how the scriptures help us work out this faith. And so the same problem that we have today is the same problem that was them, where, where the people who were healed by Jesus, the, we learned from Scripture, the vast majority just had their faith that he was a miracle worker, that his power was for their amusement and for their own personal good. And that's not what our trust should be in. And, and really one verse that I just, that I love, that I, that I think we all should spend time just, just absolutely just letting it pour over our minds is when Paul is writing to the church in Galatia. You got to remember who Paul was. He's one of the most 70 most powerful Pharisees in all of Israel. Uh, he was running around killing people for following Jesus. And he meets the real Jesus. And he's radically changed. And he says to the churches in Galatia, in Galatians 2.20, he said, I have been crucified with Christ. In other words, Paul said, I'm putting my trust in what Jesus did the cross. That I've got to live like Jesus. And he says, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And then he says something amazing. He says, in the life that I live now, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So ask yourself these questions. You know, when, what do you, when you have faith, do you have both those aspects, that intellectual agreement where, yes, I know that Jesus died on the cross. I know he rose three days. But if you placed all of your trust in that to work in and through, because the moment you place your trust in it and you repent, and you're, you are literally recreated and you are sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. And then we have the ability to run that race when we do face calamities, when we do face trials, because we will. James talks about it. Paul talks about it. Peter talks about it. The Gospels talk about it. Constantly, we're told we will have trials, but take heart, have faith. Christ has overcome death, hell, the grave, the world, and he has rose from the dead. What is your faith in? Spend time talking with your friends and your family about true biblical faith. Take care.